just to recap where, where we are, uh, we started off with a big nutrient cycles and we learned about what processes, at least the idea of what processes play a role for different nutrients. Uh, and we realized that there are different pools in the soil and in the vegetation soil um, system. And we, we tried to first flush out what are these pools, what, what is in these boxes, uh, what, what do nu nutrients look like in the soil. And then now we are trying to understand what these little arrows are, the transformations between the pools. And last week we started off with looking at adsorption, which is really one of the main processes controlling um, nutrient availability in soil. <clears throat> and we learned a little bit about how we measure that, how we assess uh, retention capacity of the, uh, of the soil, which is cation exchange capacity. We learned about what are the driving forces of adsorption, and we learned something about specific adsorption and unspecific adsorption. Uh, we learned something about variable charge and uh, permanent charge within the electrostatic adsorption. Um, and uh, we carry this over now into this session. Here, uh, a few key nutrients that we want to look at over um, the next few slides. Uh, basically, all the nutrients, since they're all charged, have electrostatic adsorption. So you see under nitrate, ammonium, phosphate, sulfate, potassium, everywhere you can see electrostatic adsorption. Seems to be that this is really an important process, electrostatic adsorption. Um, but you see also that there might be other mechanisms for nutrient retention of these cations and anions. Uh, nitrate, actually, we can safely assume that there's only electrostatic adsorption to mineral surfaces, and usually that's very weak, this adsorption, because it is an anion, and most soils have not a net anion exchange capacity, but we have cation exchange capacity. There are a few soils, and I showed very early in the semester, I showed uh, an example where we had a huge amount of nitrate in subsoils that can happen in tropical soils, um, where we have actually a net anion exchange capacity. But that happens really only on the very low end of the pH, as we saw last, uh, last week. Ammonium, electrostatic adsorption, but then also something very specific to ammonium and actually also to potassium. They, they are behaving very, very similar in that respect. Um, with two to one clay minerals, and we'll, uh, we'll look at that in a second. Phosphate has a variety of mechanisms where it can specifically adsorb to surfaces, and uh, especially the oxides come into play here. We'll look at that also, as well as sulfate, quite similar to phosphate, but just not as strong as phosphate. And that's what we're looking at over the next few slides. Electrostatic adsorption to mineral surfaces, potassium as we had it before, no change, just because potassium is positively charged. Uh, clay minerals, especially those in temperate regions, have a net negative charge. Those two go together. But then we have something odd happening as well uh, with ammonium and potassium. Uh, especially smectites, but, um, but basically many of these two to one clay minerals uh, can widen up um, and uh, water goes into these, uh, into these interlayers of the, of the clay mineral, and that's where the potassium can go in. And if you reverse this process of uh, substituting potassium with water, you get a potassium interlayer in here and a contraction of the, um, of the clay minerals. And if we look at that um, specifically here, we have, again, our silicium tetraeders in the 2 to 1 clay mineral and the um, uh, aluminum octaeder. And you see up there is something like a ring up there. Um, and the potassium actually fits snuck into that ring. Uh, if you look from the top, so this is the view from the top simplified, uh, then the potassium fits into this and disappears completely. Nothing sticking out or very little is sticking out here. Um, and that means the potassium, and the same is for ammonium, for some odd reasons, ammonium, NH4, and potassium have the same size and fit both into that, into that area. And if I uh, pull up my fancy diagram here again, this is exactly the same. And if I turn that around um, to, towards the silicium, octa, uh, silicium tetraedas, then you see these 
these spaces open up. Again, these are the spaces that we're talking about, and the potassium fits in right in there, right into this middle thing, everywhere in here. So that is what I'm talking about here. Um, and that leads to the contraction then of the clay minerals and uh, the potassium and ammonium is essentially trapped in there and it's hard to get the ammonium out. Uh, still somewhat exchangeable, um, but much harder to get out. Definitely protected from leaching. Phosphate, we have a different uh, situation. We have, of course, electrostatic adsorption as we have for nitrate and sulfate, all the other anions. Um, just by simple attraction of the negatively charged phosphate to positively charged uh, clay surfaces or oxide surfaces. But then we have also um, some covalent bondage, so real chemical absorption, chemical reaction of the phosphate with, for instance, here depicted the aluminum oxide. Uh, so the phosphate molecule goes right onto the aluminum with one oxygen, and we have a, a one bondage uh, and we usually call that fixation. Um, not really important, but in colloquial uh, slang, so to speak, uh, we talk about fixation of phosphate, something that's not easily reversible. Um, and if, uh, if that progresses towards a double bondage, here the phosphate double bondages to the aluminum, then we call, some people call it even an occlusion um, of phosphate, and that is then considered irreversible. Um, but at this point, a lot of that is actually just model um, concepts. It's very hard to prove, prove that. There are um, x-ray techniques that try to prove that. So this is, this is an ongoing research topic. Um, so th that is one of the areas that we are not quite clear about how they actually bond. Um, and this is a, a topic of, of discussion. Here are some, um, some model concept, and I think someone of you mentioned it already. Inten I think, David, you mentioned it, uh, capacity and um, intensity concept that helps us understand how available nutrient pools interact with um, these so-called fixed or occluded. So pools, we, we, let's step, uh, take a step back. If, um, if we look at all these occluded and fixed pools of phosphate, but maybe also of ammonium that are trapped in there. The plants can't get it. It's not leachable immediately. Uh, are they completely gone? Or are they, are they somewhere interacting? And that's, that's exactly the question here, um, to, to uh, understand how these, how these very unavailable pools might interact with available pools. And here we have just a very simplified um, model of that. Uh, so if we, if we think that this is water in, in these two basins, and these two basins are connected with a, with a small valve down here, and here we have here a container that I call available pool. So that is, uh, let's say, this is the, the nutrient pool that the plant can access. Now, let's pretend the plant takes a deep sip uh, a large sip of nutrients, it drinks all that water here, uh, being, being nutrients, um, then necessarily the available pool will go down. Since it is a, a connected to an unavailable pool, or not immediately available pool, this available pool will get replenished. But that will of course depend on the size of this valve. And that is, that is for instance, um, yeah, a phosphate molecule has to get out of this covalent bondage into solution, or a potassium has to find its way out of the clay mineral into solution. And so the rate of this flux from this unavailable pool to the available pool is then determined by what exactly this process is. But definitely this will go down uh, and we get a replenishment so that these two levels equilibrate at some point again after the, the uh, plant has taken up uh, some nutrients. So we, we reach a new available nutrient pool level. Now what happens if these two pool sizes are the same? It's the same amount of available pool, but let's pretend 
this is an uh, noxisole with a lot of phosphate fixing capacity, whereas this is just an antisole or a, an inceptisole around here that doesn't fix a lot of phosphorus. So probably we, we might encounter the possibility that both soils have the same amount of available, but this soil has a lot more unavailable because it has, it experienced a lot of uh, phosphorus fixation. Now if we take the same, remove the same amount of nutrients, we will reach a different equilibrium than here. We will have still more phosphorus in this, in this soil than in this soil if the mechanism of replenishing or the rate of replenishing this available pool is the same between those two. And this, is, th this thinking process is, tries to be captured in, in this concept of intensity and capacity. And I have really no idea why they call it intensity and capacity. Um, but uh, intensity is, is the quantity of soluble organic P in the solution. That's what they call in the literature uh, intensity and the capacity is um, the, the uh, possibility of replenishing that um, when available, uh, available nutrients are, are removed. Um, and that can be determined with uh, different, um, usually isotopic approaches because you, you can't really discern uh, nutrients that are already there from those that are flowing from one pool in the other. So you need some, some kind of tracer technique. Yeah, Helen. Yeah. Okay. The A is the available pool is it's this here and this here. And this is unavailable. Okay. Yeah. And and this is what the plant takes up. And this should be the same. I tried to, to paint it that this is the same. So this area should be depleted by that amount. And we get a new equilibrium level that is not going down by the amount that otherwise I would have to paint it down here. It's not going down here because there's some replenishment from this unavailable pool. But there's more replenishment here than here because simply there's more unavailable over here than over here. Shall we repeat that one more time? Is there something, uh, David, you, can you explain it again maybe? Does, can't hurt uh, to, to do it again, just to let it sink in because it's an important concept. I'm not sure I can explain it any better. Um, or explain it the same way, uh, just, just so everyone hears it again. Well, the intensity represents the, the phosphorus which is in the soil solution. And um, in, the, in the one at the bottom, if that soil solution phosphorus is used up, the bottom soil has, <coughs> has a greater capacity, which means a greater ability to buffer that change in phosphorus. So, um, so it will better be able to replenish the soil solution phosphorus than the, the soil at the top. Yeah, great. Yeah, I mean, you used some other words and added, and that's exactly what I want because sometimes just just using a few different words helps a lot. Yeah, exactly. So th this is this is an important concept and. Uh, and it again brings home the message that by just looking at this here, the amount of this, we don't really capture all that will happen with the soil if plants are removed or fertilizer added. Can you come up with uh, some scenarios? Angela, you are well prepared for, for doing that with, with your lab experiment in, in mind. What, uh, what do you think what will happen if you add nutrients now? push some of that back into the unavailable form. Um, so depending on how big that capacity depends on how much is going to be taken into unavailable form. Yeah, so for instance, exactly Angela, and, and if this is now our fertilizer, let's just turn this arrow around. If this is our fertilizer and we have the same available pool, we measure maybe 20 grams of phosphorus per kilogram soil, in New York State, 
and we fertilize with 50 kilograms of phosphorus. What will happen in those two soils? Can you? Yeah, well, well let's see. In the first soil, um, you add, let's say, yeah, you add the same amount of fertilizer, but the amount that is plant available is going to be higher because it doesn't remove as much to that capacity side because there's not as much capacity to hold that phosphorus. Exactly. So when we, if we add the same amount of phosphorus to both of these soils, we probably see a higher response uh, here and have a more available phosphorus here than here. Although our phosphorus test levels in the beginning would say they are the same. But no, if we apply the same amount of phosphorus to both soils, we will see more phosphorus available here than here. And that is because this has a higher capacity than that, so more will jump over here than over here there's not that much space. So these, these are very important implications for nutrient management. Um, and, and uh, well, if you're doing then, going back also to methodological part, and you all do experiments with these kind of uh, questions, um, only looking at this part sometimes completely overlooks what might happen if, if there is an induced management change um, with, with these soil ecosystems. Uh, another example is uh, maybe uh, um, um, uh, well let's let's leave it at that and, and discuss uh, some of the biological phenomena later. But but this keep that in mind uh, when uh, when looking at at um, nutrient dynamics. Uh, there are other nutrients, of course, micronutrients that uh, we might want to look at as well. Here are some uh, clay minerals uh, absorb. Uh, copper, very uh, specific, zinc, iron, and manganese, unspecific, oxides, especially copper, and I mentioned earlier that copper is very, very strongly absorbed by soil organic matter. Um, I don't want to go too much into detail with those micronutrients. Um, there's a lot of uh, very specific research going on with those. Um, but something that relates also to our lab experiments uh, of group 8, which we don't have, but I'll, I'll share the, the um, experiment with you uh, each week to the appropriate group number, um, is the absorption of micronutrients, especially zinc, but also um, uh, copper, for instance, and iron, to uh, carbonates. And you here see here a study where uh, the zinc in solution was measured to the adsorbed zinc with three different soils that had different amounts of calcium carbonate. A Tucson loam with 11% carbonates up to Elfrida sand with 0.4% uh, carbonates. And you can see that these, um, the adsorption lines up very well with the amount of uh, calcium carbonate in the soil. With a Tucson loam, you get a very strong adsorption at already low zinc in the solution, so you, you can't get really a lot of zinc in solution uh, until you have a lot of zinc already absorbed, uh, and at some point the zinc in solution um, increases, but already at very high absorption of zinc. And uh, here the superstition sand and the Alfreda sand um, have much lower absorption per unit of zinc in solution. Um, so that's, that's important for some micronutrients, the absorption to uh, calcium carbonates. Uh, boron and molybdenum also bonding especially to clay minerals um, how and whether uh, boron is complex in organic matter is still a matter of debate but we'll don't remain very long in there um, some minor thoughts but can be important in some soils are so-called other nutrient retention mechanisms for instance something retention in soil water pores um, just simply by soil water not leaching because they're in small pores of um, having films around particles um, and they don't leach. Uh, field capacity is, for instance, uh, is a um, uh, parameter that is defined by the amount of water that is retained just against, uh, against gravity in the soil. Uh, so by, by nutrients being retained in this water that doesn't drain freely, uh, we retain nutrients. Of course, that's a relatively strong, for, uh, um, relatively strong forces of the water. You can't really get this water out. Uh, we usually, when we really want to get water out, um, what do we do by if we, if we determine, for instance, water content gravimetrically? 
what do we do then? Put it in the oven, yeah. At at what degree? Yeah, so around 100, very often a standard procedure is 105 degree for 48 hours. That's pretty warm. Uh, so you get, you get most water out, but even at that temperature, you don't get all the water out. You can heat it even up uh, further, and, and you get some of the crystalline water out at higher temperatures only. Um, so you need a lot of forces to get this water out. Definitely under normal condition, that's not possible. Um, since it's very little water that is retained like that in, in many soils, there, uh, there might not be a lot of nutrients captured with that, but it uh, might be an important mechanism for nutrient retention of nutrients that are otherwise not at all absorbed. And nitrate comes to mind immediately, um, which would not be absorbed by electrostatic forces in most soils anyways. Um, then we uh, have a possibility of actually quantifying these uh, absorption mechanisms um, and calculate something that's called an absorption isotherm. And who knows why that was ever called isotherm? Well, it says iso is uh, the same therm uh, temperature. So at the same temperature, absorption was done and, uh, and um, that's why we call them absorption isotherms. Um, but don't get distracted by that name. What it essentially only is, is making experiments by adding a nutrient to soil, shaking it, and seeing what is left in the solution, and subtracting what you added from what is left in the solution that must be absorbed, uh, and plotting the what's still in solution to the amount absorbed. Um, that's all that it is. Uh, and we'll learn that uh, Angela will teach you uh, all about phosphorus adsorption isotherms in her laboratory. So you hear it again in the lab and then uh, when later we, um, we will see her results. If we look at this relationship that I just described between equilibrium concentration in the solution and the amount adsorbed in the soil, then this relationship can actually take a number of forms. One is that you have very little coming into solution for a larger amount absorbed, similar to the calcium carbonate zinc relationship that we just had. So you get this, what they call then an L type. I don't know how they see an L in that, but it's an L type um, shape of a curve. But you can also have rather the opposite that. At the beginning, you hardly get any absorption if you add more of a, of a um, substance. And the absorption only kicks in at higher equilibrium concentrations and goes up. At some point, it has to stop. It's, there's no infinite capacity of the soil to absorb anything. So at some point, it has to curve up. This puzzles us with what I just said. Um, this seems to be a linear um, absorption isotherm. Um, which cannot really exist. Um, but the rationale is to calculate linear adsorption isotherms is that you, would, uh, that you would just take out specific ranges of an adsorption isotherm and it is actually valid for that range of concentration. It cannot be valid up here. At some point it has to flatten out and become horizontal. There is no infinite adsorption capacity for anything in soil really. Um, it has to go down a little bit. H-type is really an extreme event of the L-type where you get hardly any uh, nutrient in solution um, until there's a huge amount of that substance absorbed to soil. Why are we doing this? Um, well, there's, there's several neat uh, possibilities if you do that. First is you can see by the shape of these adsorption isotherms what kind of mechanism is behind the adsorption. Um, a simple electrostatic adsorption where the space is not limited, or there's enough space, enough surface, a potassium comes or a magnesium comes, and there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of negative surface charges around, so probably for each magnesium that comes you get a proportion adsorbed. And that might be a linear relationship. Um, so 
uh, and, and maybe even a one-to-one -one relationship. There's one going into equilibrium, another going uh, absorbed and so on. Uh, but for phosphorus, we probably will expect that we add phosphorus, we add phosphorus to iron oxide rich soils and they immediately get fixed. And you see hardly anything. So probably those two nutrients will have very, very different absorption <coughs> isotherms. So we can learn something about the mechanism. A specific absorption will probably have rather this shape, whereas an unspecific absorption will maybe have this or this shape. Um, this is a different scenario where at the beginning there's something happening with, um, with the uh, uh, with the substance that, that is absorbing uh, that leads it to have a higher absorption once a critical uh, concentration in the solution is reached. Um, I don't know if you came across already some of these substances, but very often it can be organic substances that, that uh, first uh, need to link up with their bodies and then they start absorbing. So they have to form larger molecules um, and then they're absorbed to, uh, to hydrophobic surfaces or, or something like that. Um, that can happen. So we learn something about the mechanism of absorption and we can compare different, um, different nutrients. And then the next step is to actually not only make these graphs, but put some regressions through it. And by doing that, and there's a lot of guys that have um, gotten famous through that, um, that just found that there are specific so-called isotherms that, um, that fit very well through these, uh, through these data, and there are different possibilities. Um, what is interesting is that you can calculate then these constants here, and these constants are, yeah, uh, are important. Um, you can uh, calculate, for instance, the maximum sorption capacity, so how much is the maximum that you can sorb in these soils, or something like an affinity constant, how fast, how fast does, does this um, uh, curve go up. So for, uh, for phosphate, you probably would expect in an oxysol a higher maximum sorption capacity than in a uh, than in an anti-soil or so. So a soil around here will probably have a lower maximum sorption capacity than a soil in the tr humid tropics for phosphate. And probably phosphate will always have a higher affinity constant than calcium for a given soil. And this is very important for nutrient availability as well as nutrient retention if we think about uh, environmental pollution um, and uh, yeah, contamination of, of um, surface or groundwaters. So if you, if you, you can fit those through these, um, through these data, um, and some fit better than others for different shapes of these isotherms, um, and you have the opportunity then to calculate, cal calculate these affinity constants and the uh, maximum absorption capacity. And you can compare different soils quantitatively. You just not only compare them by looking at the graphs and saying, this is a bit higher than the other, um, but you can actually make tables with the affinity constants and compare different studies, compare different sites and so on. It's much handier than, um, and, and uh, much more quantitative than having just um, the, uh, the adsorption isotherms in a graph. Let's look at um, the importance of these mechanisms for uh, real agroecosystems. And let's travel to a feral soil in Togo and a maize cropping system. So we have here uh, two maize fields. <coughs> and we fertilize one with potassium fertilizer and the other we don't fertilize at all. And 138 uh, kilograms per hectare a year. That is uh, maybe on the higher end of what a Togolese farmer uh, would ever dream of applying. I think probably he usually applies zero. Um, or sometimes maybe 10 or so if we can grab uh, a bag. Um, but for the, for the exercise here, um, that, that is irrelevant. Precipitation probably gives the same because these fields are adjacent. And then interestingly, the leaching loss was barely different. Here, five kilograms per hectare a year. Here, eight kilograms per hectare a year. Yes, this is maybe 
70% uh, higher, but still very low. And here you see you, you fertilize with zero, here you fertilize with 138 kilograms per hectare and year. Uh, so it seems you fertilize, but there's almost nothing more leached than uh, in this soil where we didn't fertilize. If we look at the soil in this experiment, then we can immediately understand that and given the uh, prelude that I gave you about um, adsorption, you probably guessed this already. Um, here a depth profile up to 160 centimeter depth and the exchangeable potassium on the x-axis and you can see uh, that this treatment K2 uh, that I, where I put the uh, red arrows on um, with a high potassium fertilizer um, had a significantly and quite substantially larger amount of exchangeable potassium in the topsoil than the unfertilized control. Um, so it simply was retained in the soil. Uh, the soil was able to retain it and that is a, a, an effect of, of this uh, uh, adsorption. Probably some of it um, maybe uh, this specific adsorption, but a lot probably electrostatic adsorption. If we look at phosphorus, I'll ask you to uh, read a paper by Joost et al. Um, and that is what we want to discuss right now. Uh, and I'll want to ask you again to form groups. Maybe the four of you can do that. Discuss that in the, in the plenary. And uh, we'll have a... Uh, well, uh, uh, starter question would be which, which of the soils absorb um, a lot of phosphorus. You guys, what, what did you say? Which soils? Krista? Clay. Um, Clay which soils? So ones like <laughs> oxy soils, um, yeah. soils which, uh, which have clays. Kaolinites. Exactly. So, like yeah. a lot of tropical, highly weathered and leached soils. Yeah. Which have like um, iron and aluminum to to bind phosphate. Yeah. So especially infamous are our iron and aluminum oxide rich soils, and we find them, as you said, in the tropics very often, uh, where it's warm and um, a lot of rain. Um, and these are very often called then oxysols in the US classification or feral soils in the FAO classification or latosolo in the Brazilian classification or uh, what have you. I don't know the Russian at the moment. But, um, so they're... Hmm? They're kresnozems, I think. Kresnozems yeah. in the Russian? Um, I, I can, yeah, that's, some, that's it just, uh, something with zim in the back. It sounds pretty good. where I'm from, we, we've got some in Tasmania, even though it's not a tropical place. Okay. I think it's like a remnant of... Of warmer tropics, climates? A, a remnant of warmer climates. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They always call them Krasner's names. Okay. Where, where in the U.S. would you find those? Highly weathered soils, red soils. <laughs> hmm? Hawaii, a little bit. Uh, it's warm in Hawaii and sunny. Um, not hugely abundant, but yes, you find them. The southeast, yeah, uh, like Georgia, South Carolina, uh, you find a lot of these very red soils, oxide-rich soils. Um, Florida a little bit, and then of course something like Puerto Rico, um, you, you find that also. So it's, a, it's a, an issue not only um, for, uh, for the tropical, entire tropical countries, and, and if you have looked at um, the folks who did this, uh, this paper here, uh, where do they come from? Uh, yes and no. Um, Joost, uh, Kamprad. I mean, the, everything could be Brazilian. Uh, it's an immigration country, immigrant country, huh? I'm guessing Holland. Holland. Uh, maybe it German. could be. Um, but if you look at the at the credits down there on the right, lower right side, yeah. So it's North Carolina. There, there are um, uh, some co-authors that come actually uh, Cornell University if you look at that uh, there's ones also from Brasilia um, and one from Hawaii uh, that moved to Hawaii but 
uh, yeah, so it's, it's Kamprad is the, the major professor. He's a very, very famous guy uh, from North Carolina State University. I call him also Mr. Soil Acidity. He, uh, in, the, in the 60s and 70s, he uh, pioneered a lot of these um, acid soil research. Um, a paper that you probably always will cite if you do something with phosphorus adsorption isothermis, uh, Fox and Kamprad from 1970 something or so. Um, so uh, this is a name uh, uh, to remember. He, he did a lot of work and his group with, um, with uh, um, acid soils. If you move to the next question, uh, just this all the soils, uh, all the phosphorus that we apply, uh, is it available, unavailable to, to plants? Um, we heard about the phosphorus fixation, uh, or is there something also that the, that the plant can can grab? You guys? Any of you? Well, this one, if you answer, you kind of get to that last one as well, because it depends on how you apply it and how much you apply. Yeah. That's sort of the answer to that question, I would think. Um, because if you apply a whole lot in a band application, then there will be some that's available for the plants before it gets changed or stored into less or more recalcitrant forms. Okay. But if you band apply a fairly low application, I mean, sorry, broadcast apply at low applications, then it's all going to get changed over pretty quickly. So, so you mentioned a few keywords there as something quickly, and so there seems to be something with time. Uh, a rate of, of change from the available pool and the unavailable pool. So if you apply a lot, um, very concentrated per unit soil, uh, then you uh, have the chance of retaining some of the phosphate in available form before it changes into unavailable form. Um, so uh, yes, even at, uh, at low application rates, um, you would find some will remain in the available pool. But since the rate of change into the so-called capacity in this unavailable uh, pool that is corresponds in some form with the available pool, uh, you'll probably not get a huge impact. But if you, if you do a lot more, then, then that works. Um, yeah, and you already asked, answered sort of the last question. Uh, and banding then helps, of course. Um, if, you're not, if you're not spreading it all over, but you concentrate it on a smaller unit, of area, which means also a smaller unit of soil surface uh, and, and uh, aggregate surface or clay surfaces, then you have the chance to retaining some of it in available form. What does the double acid method remind you of? Um, who's got it? Angela, you are the expert. Yeah, um, it's the mimic solution. We're using it for phosphorus. Yeah, so that we call it also a Melik solution nowadays, Melik 1 solution. Um, that should just sensitize you that we want to always have a good look at the methods. Um, I think we, we reiterate that throughout the lab sessions always. There's always a methodological part and an agroecological part. Um, and, and given the fact that we now know more, know now more about these different pools and what they actually want to understand what these extraction methods assess, we can also uh, understand better what the limitations are for looking at those uh, results um, for our understanding what happens when you do a management change. Yeah, great. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll hopefully um, got, some, got some sense now of, uh, about um, this huge uh, problem with phosphorus adsorption that is uh, um, the, and the enormous resources that, that can uh, go into um, overcoming phosphorus limitation in high oxide, um, so, uh, high oxide mineral containing soils. Um, another important process, and now we leave the absorption behind, we'll pick up absorption later on. So what, what we do now is we'll, we'll look at different um, um, mechanisms and transformations in soil um, and then in the next block, we'll sort of re, uh, revisit all these and look at how they change with different environmental conditions. But let's first really understand what all these processes are about. Um, precipitation is a different uh, type of 
uh, transformation that a nutrient can undergo in soils that control nutrient availability and environmental um, behavior. Short-term precipitation uh, for different nutrients. Nitrogen, not really anything. So we'll forget about nitrogen here. Phosphorus um, can have important precipitation reactions uh, with um, calcium in calcium carbonate rich soils at high pH and can have uh, form aluminum and iron phosphate precipitates in uh, acid soils below a pH of 5 or 4.5. So it seems that there is an optimum range in which phosphorus can live which is somewhere between uh, 5 and, uh, and 7. Uh, and usually 5.5 to 6.5 is a range where you can say phosphorus is probably well av available. You realize also again that the pH seems to be really an important driver of nutrient availability and that is really true throughout. So understanding pH effects on soil um, is, is crucial for understanding nutrient availability. Sulfur, uh, at high pH, uh, calcium sulfates can form another word for calcium sulfate if it's in crystalline form. Gypsum, gypsum exactly. So gypsum, calcium sulfate, or gypsum is calcium sulfate, calcium sulfate is gypsum. Um, then um, other precipitates are uh, iron sulfate, uh, sulfide, what, where do you find that? What's, what's your guess where, where you find that forming? Peatlands, so what's the, what's the issue here in peatlands? Wet. Wet, so it's anoxic conditions. Sulfate, SO, a lot of O's in sulfate. If that O goes out because you have oxygen um, uh, deficiency, you get the formation of sulfide and that reacts with iron, especially under reduced conditions, water reduced. Um, where, where you have uh, iron uh, in solution. Um, potassium really not a lot of precipitates, not really important. Uh, calcium, magnesium, you all know lime, calcium, magnesium carbonates uh, or dolomites. Um, micronutrients, um, somewhat somewhere with carbonates uh, or sulfates um, possible. Uh, here an example, precipitation a series of different uh, calcite um, here in the upper <laughs> left corner uh, calcite with no phosphate in solution added and then increasing amounts of phosphate in the solution and you can see how the calcite has these nice cubes up there um, and then it, um, calcium phosphate precipitates uh, form on the surfaces until you can hardly see that that this was once this nice, nice um, uh, cubicle uh, calcites, but calcium phosphates have formed all over. We realize though that there's really, uh, as in, in many, many processes in soil, it's, it's really, we, we try to categorize what's happening just to help us conceptualize the soil processes. But many things really are a continuum of substances or processes. This is, this is the real challenge in soil. Uh, I mean, it's, it, you look at it and, and it's such an inhomogeneous, highly complex mixture of minerals, organic matter, uh, live and dead biomass, um, roots and, uh, and minerals. It's, it's, really, it's really very difficult. And, and you see here, this is another example where uh, processes are, are really not that separate if you look at it. Um, what happens if, for instance, uh, phosphate adsorbs on a calcite surface, that there are probably some phosphates that bond somewhere and then it's probably an adsorption. Um, then probably you get more of those and they form more intricate and more uh, stable bridges and you find that this is maybe fixation. But then you find a lot of it is, is um, uh, forming here on the soil surface, a lot of the phosphates uh, bind to the calcium and you find calcium phosphates precipitate. So there, there are, there's really a, an, a, a continuum very often between very weak adsorption to occlusion or stronger adsorption to precipitation. Um, and we just try to 
to divide those in different processes because it helps us also to understand ecological importance because a, a, a precipitate then reacts completely different than just an absorption. Um, the next big topic is mineralization of nutrients. Uh, and um, this is, I would say, next to adsorption, the other very, very important uh, transformation of nutrients in soil. And as we said, they're mainly important for three nutrients. And these are the three nutrients that are mainly in organic or largely in organic form. Nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur. These are the three nutrients where we need to watch out for a lot of biological uh, processes that control their turnover. First, we talk about here the mineralization, so the release of nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur from organic material. And a little later, we talk about the reverse process, which is immobilization. Um, mineralization and this release of nitrogen and sulfur and phosphorus is mainly mediated by the activity of heterotrophic microorganisms. And they are actually very often, first of all, not after the nutrients, but they're after the carbon. They're just hungry. They want a food for their metabolism. They need to respire carbon as an energy source. And as a byproduct, they release the nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus. Then we have uh, an, an important distinction is um, the uh, aerobic and anaerobic uh, processes in soil that are uh, mediated by microorganisms that can be um, obligate anaerobic, uh, aerobic, but most of them just do both to varying extents. Um, important for us as ecologists or, or that look at the product and the effect on nutrient biogeochemistry and soil fertility is what, uh, what the end product is. Um, in Arabic soils where we have a lot of air or um, enough air to have mainly aerobic um, metabolism, the end product is mainly CO2 and then the mineral form. So we have all the carbohydrates and lignin are munched up by the microorganisms that produce CO2 and water and the nutrients are released in mineral form. Anaerobic um, mineralization, however, uh, you have mainly um, organic nutrients forms uh, and in form of acids, uh, which very often leads then to um, acidification also of soils. Um, where, where would you find, uh, find that, for instance? Peat soils, yeah. So the peat soils again are very usually on the lower side with the, with the <coughs> pH. Uh, a lot of acid, um, um, organic acids are formed. Peat. Forests, boreal forests. Boreal forests. Um, there might be a bit more humid. Um, it's colder. You have moisture building up. Yeah. So also there you have probably a lot of um, organic acids building. Um, and hand in hand with that goes actually the mediators of that. Uh, whether you have an abundance of bacteria or fungi. Bacteria are usually very active and predominant in uh, um, aerobic soils and with neutral pH, whereas fungi are very often dominant in uh, the metabolism or what happens uh, with organic matter turnover in low pH soils and in litter layers with low organic matter quality and, and uh, again bogs and, and forest soils especially um, in high latitudes are uh, probably a good good example. Um, forest soils under pine um, is a prime example for, uh, for larger litter layers uh, with an abundance of fungi and the production of organic acids. And we had, uh, not too long ago, we had a slide on the, on the projector from one of these soils that are then very, very typically formed under these sort of conditions. What's What's the name of that soil? What colors did the soil have? White, so very white and bleached, almost bleached horizon, pretty far up, just below 
actually the litter layer. Sometimes there's almost no mineral A horizon, but there's just the O layers, the litter layers that produce a lot of organic acids, um, very acid, maybe a pH of two point something, <coughs> three uh, point something, and then as soon as you go in the mineral soil, you find hardly a pH that is below four. Um, but, uh, but then an A horizon that's maybe just, just very, very tiny A horizon, and then a could be very large AE or E horizon, an alluvial horizon where all the organic matter has been leached out, all the iron oxides have been leached out. And then below this reddish, first a brownish horizon where actually these organic acids are, re, um, are, are um, re-precipitating and, and stopping their movement. And then uh, a reddish horizon where the iron oxides are actually uh, precipitating again to forming reddish iron oxides. Uh, another shot at the name. That will be potzols. Potzols in the FAO classification and spodozols in the US classification. Um, so these are, are uh, formed under these, um, under these uh, acid um, organic layers in, in uh, uh, higher latitudes. If we look at the organic matter in soil, <coughs> uh, and you'll find a lot more detailed discussion of the organic matter dynamics in John Duxbury's class that is <coughs> specifically about organic matter. Uh, it's a 600 level class, or in my 600 level class, where we uh, look at soil organic matter dynamics in the context of nutrient cycles in ecosystems. Um, but here, very briefly, uh, a lot of it is water, but we are interested mainly at this point of the dry matter. And actually, our nutrients um, are this little pie here, 8% of the dry matter um, are so-called ash or nutrients. So that's what we're interested in, there's, but there's a lot of other stuff in soil organic matter that can be also broken up uh, in different uh, organic forms, um, cellulose, hemicellulose, lignins, proteins, fats, waxes, sugars, uh, phenols, um, and uh, so these interact very, very closely with these compounds and the release of the nutrients, as you can, under can understand, in this whole mixture of very complex uh, organic matter is uh, very tightly linked to each other. Um, a simple pattern of uh, the mineralization dynamics um, here with time, very typical examples and, and uh, experiments, just an incubation experiment. We'll, we'll put some soil in the incubator like uh, group one does. Uh, we added maybe some organic material. Let's say we add alpha alpha to the soil. Uh, what you get is um, a steep increase in CO2 evolution very early on where the organic material is mineralized to CO2 and water. Um, and uh, once that subsides a little bit, then you get a increase in the nitrate level or ammonium and nitrate level. And that's what we call then the, the net mineralization, this increase uh, or the mineralization, this increase in, uh, in nitrate levels over time. Um, and we'll revisit that then with the interaction between immobilization and mineralization. Uh, what is important to realize is that this release of nitrogen, for instance, and it applies to some extent also to sulfur and phosphorus, uh, is um, very tightly linked to the uh, um, quality of the organic material. Um, and there are a lot of different organic matter characteristics that con control this nitrogen and sulfur and phosphorus um, uh, release. The nitrogen content is one parameter that is important, of course. The higher the nitrogen content of a, um, organic material, the more readily it's released. But also the CN ratio might be an important uh, component. Um, lipids, waxes that might protect the organic material from being decomposed. Lignin and lignin to, and then the lignin to N ratio, so the, the relationship between lignin and nitrogen. Phenols have been found to um, be controlling nitrogen release or then some more complex uh, relationships between those parameters. If we look at this, at this um, example here, 
this seems to be a very straightforward situation where nitrogen content is linearly and directly related to the mineralization or immobilization. Um, so the higher the nitrogen content of the residue is, the more nitrogen you find in the soil solution. Uh, above this line here, it's a net production of mineral nitrogen. Below this line, it's actually uh, a net withdrawal. Uh, but still, this relationship seems to be uh, fairly linear. Um, but we realized over actually the last 20 years, and I think the first papers on that have come out in the um, 70s and 80s, but more intensively than in the 90s, realized that um, uh, there is more to it than just the nitrogen content. This is a more complex example um, of this relationship uh, with, uh, of, of release, nitrogen release, and um, uh, quality parameters. And this is a, a relationship with the phosphorus uh, plus lignin divided by nitrogen ratio, um, where you see with a higher polyphenol and lignin and a lower nitrogen uh, content of the organic mineral um, uh, material, you get a lower cumulative nitrogen release. And this relationship doesn't seem to be linear anymore, uh, but curvilinear. You get a steep decrease at the beginning if, if your quality parameter goes up, so you have more phosphorus, more lignin, and lower nitrogen, then um, the release plummets really very quickly, uh, actually up to a threshold where this is about 12, uh, and then there's hardly any change um, whether you, the, uh, the nitrogen content further decreases or the phosphorus and lignin uh, content further increases. You can break this up also in different, um, different areas and you find that at the beginning here it's actually a pretty good linear relationship. And that highlights um, some of the issues, uh, how you, how you uh, uh, delineate your, your sample set. Uh, if you just look at those materials here, and these are uh, all the leaves actually, whereas these are all um, twigs and roots material, then you see if you would only look at the leaves, you're probably uh, finding a linear relationship uh, and a good relationship with this um, parameter. If you're only looking at the, uh, at the more lignous material and widen your quality spectrum, then that is probably quite different. Um, and with that, we we'll, should stop for now. We'll uh, continue with the mineralization and the next reading, which is on nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus mineralization. It's more a, a longer uh, paper that I ask you to read. Um, we'll continue with my, uh, mineralization and mineralization.